Good day to you, and thanks for tuning in, and welcome to The Four Winds, Episode 2, a Christian Bible study and discussion talk show. Greetings and peace be unto you. This is Sam from Mark13Records.com and the Mark13 Records YouTube channel. And we're 1234 Rock Hard Bible Study Channel. And I am Bruce from Just Thought Studies Channel on YouTube.
And this episode, we'll be discussing familiar spirits, murmuring against God, and fallen angels and giants. Before we begin this Bible study, let us begin by asking our Father for blessing and wisdom and guidance and understanding from His Most Holy Word in prayer. So let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, glory be unto thy name forever. We come gathered before you, Father, to ask for wisdom and guidance and understanding and the ability to teach these truths to those who seek your counsel and your face. We ask, Father, that you open eyes and ears and hearts and minds to be able to receive these truths. We ask your blessing upon this endeavor, Father. We ask that you be our light down that narrow path which leads to truth. And we ask these things, Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Yahshua Messiah. Amen. Okay, to start this off, let's begin with our first subject, familiar spirits. What are, what are familiar spirits? Well, to put it simply, familiar spirits are beings of a demonic nature, which appear to those who enchant them or call them up, that is to say, who conjure them up, as the spirits of persons which were known to them in life, but which have passed on. Yet there are those that make money off of the bereaved by conjuring up spirits, which are not really the souls that have passed on to our Father. Now, most of the time this is done through fakery, like and unto magic. But other times there are those who do what is called the practice of channeling, and they speak with the voices of spirits. And supposedly the spirits are those that have passed on. This, pa uh, this practice is called necromancy. But what does our Father's Word say about this practice? Let us go now and we will cover some scriptures concerning how our Father feels about this. Then we will read from other scriptures about familiar spirits and even demons when they have spoken and where it is recorded in scripture. Let us begin with Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 9. You can turn there in your Bibles if you wish, or you can just listen in. The uh, verse will be put on the screen for you. So, again, Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 9. And verse 9 reads, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and this of course would be the land of Canaan, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. In other words, you're not going to learn to do the filth of those nations, and nations here are the Gentiles or the heathen nations. In other words, those who do not know God and who uh, worship false gods and live by fleshly means. In other words, they have no concept of our Father that brought the children forth out of Egypt. Verse 10. There shall not be found amongst you, in other words, amongst Israel, any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. Now this was the practice of Moloch. Moloch, of course, was where people would sacrifice their children or other people to uh, their god Baal. They would burn them alive as an offering to appease their gods. To continue with the verse. Or that uses divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch. Remember the witch of Endor? We will cover that story very soon. Verse 11. Or a charmer, that is to say a spirit charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. A necromancer is made up of two words, necro and romancer. It is a spirit charmer. It is one who conjures up or summons up the dead, supposedly, only it is not the dead, as in family or friends that have passed on, but rather it is evil spirits, which you could say are spiritually dead, but they speak with the voices of people that are familiar to you, and they have fooled a lot of people down through the centuries. Verse 12. For to do these things are an abomination. In other words, they are filth unto the Lord. Because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out, from before thee. 
In other words, because of these abominations and these heathen practices, God was driving out these people, the Canaanitish people, before the children of Israel. Now turn over, if you will, to the book of Isaiah, chapter 8 and verse 16, and again, the uh, verse will be provided on the screen if you don't want to turn there. We're going to begin with verse 16 of Isaiah chapter 8. So Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 16, and it reads, Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. In other words, bind up the testimony, that is the word of God, and seal up the law among my disciples. In other words, amongst my disciplined ones. Seal them, as in the seal in your forehead. Verse 17. And I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob. And I will look for him. And of course he would hide his face from the house of Jacob for a number of reasons. First and foremost, that Jacob would fall away from the Lord a number of times, as we covered in the Old Testament in many um, Bible studies. Verse 18. Behold, I and the children who the Lord hath given me are four signs and four wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts which dwelleth in Mount Zion. In other words, Israel was for signs and wonders. Those are the children that was given him. Many wonders would be worked through them. And it would open up the eyes of many. This is one reason why it is said that through Isaac would the seed be called. And of course through Jacob. Verse 19. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God? For the living to the dead? In other words, you've got your comparison there. When they tell you to seek after familiar spirits, first of all, you're not going to be talking to the dead. God does not allow that. And unto wizards that peep and mutter. In other words, they talk babble. Should not a people seek unto their God? In other words, should you not turn to God for the living to the dead? Again, your comparison. Our God is the God of the living, not of the dead. And these familiar spirits are dead spiritually. Verse 20. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, that is to say the word of God, it is because there is no light in them. And we know that our Father is he that giveth light. Verse 21. And they shall pass through it, hardly be stead and hungry. And it shall come to pass that when they shall be hungry, they shall fret themselves, and curse their king and their God, and look upward. And of course, this hunger concerns the famine, not only of the end times, but also this was a literal for their time. They would be hungry, but we're talking more about spiritual hungriness. Remember the book of Amos chapter 8. What is the famine for for the end times? It is for hearing the word of God. Verse 22. And they shall look unto the earth, and behold trouble and darkness, and dimness of anguish. And they shall be driven into darkness. Darkness always symbolic of deception and grief. And why? Because they're looking to the earth. They're looking to the fleshly. They are not looking to our Father. Thank you, Bruce. That was very good. Um, and now to continue with these familiar spirits, let's go into Isaiah 29, verse 1, and it reads, Woe to Ariel, to Ariel, which is to say, Lion of God, or the Valiant One, the city where David dwelt. Add ye year to year, and let them kill sacrifices. Ariel, in this case, is a symbolic name for Jerusalem. Verse 2, Yet I will distress Ariel, and there shall be heaviness and sorrow, and it shall be unto me as Ariel. 3, And I will camp against thee round about, and will lay seed against thee with a mount, or a nation, and I will raise forts against thee. Verse 4, And thou shalt be brought down, and shalt speak out of the ground, and thy speech shall be low out of the dust, and thy voice shall be as one of that that hath a familiar spirit. Out of the ground, and thy speech shall whisper out of the dust, which is to say, out of degradation. Verse 5, 
Moreover, the multitude of thy strangers shall be like small dust, and the multitude of the terrible ones shall be as chaff that passeth away. Yea, it shall be as an instant suddenly at his coming, Christ. 6. Thou shalt be visited of the Lord of hosts with thunder, and with earthquake, and a great noise, with storm and tempest, and the flame of the devouring fire. Verse 7. And the multitude of all the nations that fight against Ariel, even all that fight against her and her munitions, and that distress her, shall be as a dream of a night vision, like a nightmare, a night terror. Verse 8. And it shall be even as when, when a hungry man dreameth, and behold, he eateth, but when he awaketh, and his soul is empty, or as when a thirsty man dreameth, and behold, he drinketh, but he awaketh, and behold, he is faint, and his soul hath appetite. So shall the multitude of all the nations be that fight against Mount Zion. Verse 9. Stay yourselves and wonder. Cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. Verse 10. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes, the prophets and your rulers, the seers hath he covered. Last verse to complete, verse 11. And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee, and he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. And this is much like is done today. I just want to add in here with the book of Revelation. They will say, you, you can't read the book of Revelation. That's a sealed book. And they'll even tell you the same thing about Daniel. But they don't realize that the book of Daniel was sealed up for many days. In other words, it was for a time long ahead. In other words, this generation of the fig tree. And in verse 10 there, you saw that the Lord has poured out the spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes. In other words, this is that spirit of slumber. And the seers he hath covered. In other words, your seers, your diviners, he's covered their eyes. In this case, it could even be your priests or your teachers. He's covered their eyes so that they cannot see the truth. Now we will hear the story of the witch of Endor. I right, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 28 and verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for warfare to fight with Israel. And Achish said unto David, Know thou assuredly that thou shalt go out with me to battle, thou and thy men. This Achish will be the leader of the Philistines. And David said to Achish, Surely thou shalt know what thy servant can do. And Achish said to David, Therefore will I make thee keeper of mine head forever. And at this time, Saul has chased David away because Saul wanted to kill David. And if you read the entire book, you learn that Saul had an evil spirit himself and even threw a spear at David at one point, trying to kill him. Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and the wizards, out of the land. So this is one thing he did right. He by putting these people away, but watch what happens when Saul is tested. Verse four. And the Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shunem, and Saul gathered all Israel together, and they pitched in Gilboa. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid. And his heart greatly trembled. Here he is panicking. Never, ever panic. Bad things will happen. Because, watch this. Verse 6. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. See, because Saul had lost God's blessings by this time. So, God wasn't listening, nor answering him. Though Saul was right to inquire of the Lord... But Saul had not repented. He only inquired of the Lord. He just went ahead and did it without, you know, as you're supposed to, ask forgiveness for all your sins because you're going to commit them. I don't care who you are. 
If you're in the flesh, you're going to sin. So when you pray to our Father, you want to first ask for forgiveness for everything you've done since the last time you've asked for forgiveness. Absolutely. Verse 7. Then said Saul unto his servants, Take me a woman that hath a familiar spirit. Now look, why is he doing this? This is really stupid. That I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. Uh, they would have been doing him a favor if they just said, I'm sorry, we don't know of any familiar spirits. But now Saul turns to those he had put away from Israel. He got rid of all the witches and wizards. And now here he is going and inquiring to one. I kind of feel sorry for the guy. Saul will commit apostasy by listening to this enchanter. This is bad, bad. Verse 8. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment, and he went and two men with him. Now, why would he disguise himself? Because all the witches know that they've been cast away by Saul, and he's out to kill them. So he would have to disguise himself because they would, when he came walking up, they would, of course, take off running, naturally. And they came to the woman by night, and he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me him up, whom I shall name unto thee. And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done, how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Wow, what a great psychic. She didn't even know who she was talking to. Wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? See, she doesn't know she's talking to King Saul here, obviously. And she feels she is being set up by this man who doesn't know, who she doesn't know is King Saul. And Saul swore to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Well, who would he be to say that if he wasn't Saul? I mean, she really should have figured it out by then, but she's not too smart in the first place uh, because she's playing around with demons. Verse 11, Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. Now, this isn't going to work. Uh, you're to pray to our father, first of all. He already tried that, yeah, but he should have just not done anything after that. Waited for God to answer him if he was ever going to. But here we go. Verse 12. And when the woman saw Samuel. Now notice here, it's her that sees Samuel, quote unquote. She cried with a loud voice. And the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And the witch knows now who Saul is. Why? Because now her familiar spirit is informed her of this. And that's all it is. That's all she's seeing. She's hallucinating, basically, uh, because look what happens here. 13, And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? So he's asking her what she saw. He's not seeing anything. And the woman said unto Saul, I saw God's, lowercase g, ascending out of the earth. Now, why would uh, Samuel be coming up out of the earth? It is the first red flag here. Well, it's about the third or fourth one, really, but that should tell you something horribly wrong here. Verse 14, And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. Well, see, right there we know that a spiritual body is, doesn't get old. So why is this an old man? They're, angels are always look young. Anytime they're described, they're not old. And Saul perceived he that it was Samuel. He thought it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. And like I said, he wouldn't have been older. He would have appeared younger if it were him, but it's not him. And uh, if you look at Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 6 and 7, and 2 Corinthians 
chapter five, six, and eight, we when we die, we instantly go back to God who created us, no matter who you are. And so this thing that appears to be Samuel to the witch uh, never was a human. This is a demon, a fallen angel, the spirit of one. And Samuel, the familiar spirit, that is, said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? Now, see, this if this was really Samuel, again, what, he's grumpy because he got woken up? Doesn't make any sense. Because you don't sleep in a spiritual body either. And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God is departed from me, and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. 16. Then said Samuel, which is not really Samuel, it's the familiar spirit impersonating him. Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord has departed from thee and has become thine enemy? Well, that sounds like something Samuel would say, but, well, of course it does. This thing is good at imitating people. Uh, it's not Samuel who Saul had known, but Saul thinks it is. He tr believes it's Samuel that he trusted, so he's going to listen to what he says. And the Lord hath done to him as he spake by me. Well, how would he know that? Well, they have... Satan back then was running to and fro, going uh, to talk to God like he did in Job. I mean, he watched things, and he would especially be watching things that happened within Israel, and especially the kings of Israel. He even uh, got David to number the people, tempted him to do that later on. And the Lord hath done to him as he spake by me, for the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thine hand and given it to thy neighbor, even to David. So the familiar spirit know what Samuel said, so it's no marvel that they'd know his words, and for this one to even make himself to sound like Samuel. Through the woman, remember Saul's not seeing anything. It's ventriloquism is a good word for it. Verse 18, because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord, nor executes his fierce wrath upon Amalek, therefore hath the Lord done this thing unto thee this day. It's a true statement. Familiar spirits, much like Satan, will speak portions of the truth for gain, but then twist it. Remember what Satan said to Christ when he was tempting him in the wilderness? He, he quoted scripture, but he added to it, making it a lie. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. The Lord also shall deliver the host of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Then Saul fell straightway all along on the earth and was sore afraid because of the words of Samuel. It wasn't really Samuel. It was a demon, a familiar spirit, and there was no strength in him. For he had eaten no bread all the day, nor all the night. Saul believed the words of the Spirit and was fooled. If you recall, it will be Saul who takes his own life in the end because he feared what the Philistines would do to him. I think another interesting point there is Saul had not taken any bread day or night. What What is our bread? What is the bread that we partake of? Word of God. There you go. <clears throat> and, you know, oddly enough, these familiar spirits have been associated down through the years with many things. I mean, uh, people like Edgar Casey and uh, some of these other famous ones. Uh, you know, I don't want to jump through a whole bunch of dropping names here, but uh, they've been associated with making people believe in false doctrines such as reincarnation. And, um, of course, a familiar spirit, a demon or whatever, is immortal. 
they don't exist in this plane like us. They, they're not born of woman as we are. They don't come through this earth age. So they have full use of their cognitive abilities where we in the flesh only have about 15 to 18 percent of our conscious cognitive ability. So we're like putty in their hands when it comes to fooling us, but there are cases where people will go to a uh, spirit chanter, a necromancer, they, they've got different names for them today, mediums and such, and the medium will tell them, yes, I, you have memories, I, I, I can see that you lived in this place in um, Italy, I see a house, and at the end of the road there is a tall building which looks like an old castle. And of course, they name the name of the street and the people will go and investigate this and find out, oh my god, this place actually exists and the building's still here, this 800 year old building. And the rooms are just like the medium said it would be and there's the tall building. Why do you suppose that is? A lot of people would say, well, because it's because mediums have power. They're they're blessed with powers. Well, you know, there may be some mediums that are blessed with power from God, such as that help solve crimes and stuff like that. But moreover, what you've got here is a demon spirit that possessed a body 800 years ago or so or 400 years ago or at any time in the past. And of course, they can conjure up these memories and even speak the languages. I mean, we could get into a whole nother subject of uh, speaking with tongues on that. Because a lot of people believe that speaking in tongues is a bunch of uh, babble when it's not. When God, our Father, speaks, that is to say the Holy Spirit, every ear that hears it understands it. But then you've also got possessions such as happened in the time of Christ and, and various times down through history. People have been possessed by demons, but Christ gave us power over them to cast them out. To cast them out of this earth age in his name. So that's what you're dealing with here. You know, this, this has taken on a life of its own where people actually believe in reincarnation because of this nonsense. And it, it's, it's even become a religion where people who, who call themselves Christians try to knit together a whole bunch of religions, including adding reincarnation to it. And, uh, you know, we're only put into this flesh one time. We go through this flesh age but once. So there is no such thing as reincarnation. If people do have uh, what they call locked up memories or whatever of things from the past, which seem like deja vu to them, or they have these visions and have these memories. Oh, I, I was in... Um, I was in Britain in 1864 as this famous general, or I was in uh, some other place. It's because a demon passed through that person way back in that time, and all they have to do is pass through them for moments even and, and gather memories, and then they can deposit them to the medium or to the person. And that's why a lot of hypnotists will take people back and tell them they have regressed memories, and next thing you know, you know, there you go. You got people believing in things which are against God's word. Our Father's word does not say we are reincarnated. Our Father says when you leave this body, this flesh, this dust, you go instantly back to the Father which gave you. And you go there to either wait on one side of the gulf or the other, to await judgment or the millennium, it, should you be so lucky as to make it to go through the millennium. So. You know, there, there's quite a can of worms we could open up in talking about this. Uh, you guys have any thoughts on these matters? Yeah, I just want to add that to the biblically illiterate, like you said, um, Christ gave us power and authority over all of our enemies. That's including Satan and these evil spirits. And the biblically illiterate Christians, they fear demons and they fear the devil. When you have nothing to fear because you have the full army of God standing behind you and we have the victory. Um, because we stand on Christ's side, on our Heavenly Father's side. So you have nothing to fear. One more point I'd like to make is um, ghosts. There is no such thing as a ghost. 
A lot of people believe, like in the movie Ghost or various other movies, that a spirit gets trapped between this earth, this plane, and the next plane. Well, that's, that's not true. Anything that appears to you to be a ghost is not a ghost. In other words, there is no such thing as a ghost. We have a spirit. We have a soul, which goes instantly back to the Father. But there are none trapped here. Now, even members of my own family have delved into this, like, and there are many shows on TV which are entertaining, you know, paranormal detectives and taps and all this, but you notice they never find any evidence of ghosts. You know, it's always, oh, we're getting a reading here. Oh, oh, oh there's a cold spot here. Oh, oh look, at the, look at the dust swirling around here. There, there's something in here. Or it's always... Oh, oh, something, something just touched me. Was, was that you? Was that you guys? Did you touch me? You know, it, it's like it's scripted, and it most likely is, because guess what? If these shows don't get ratings, then they're canceled. So, that's what this is all about. There's no such thing as a ghost. When you die, you go back to the Father. And if you're a Christian, you either believe that, or then you have to believe that God is a liar. So, it's written in his word where your soul goes. Again, uh, Mark covered it very well. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, along about verse 7, and 2 Corinthians chapter 5, around verses 7 and 8. So, to be absent from this flesh body is to be present with the Lord. Even the malefactor on the cross. You know, this is one who had done evil all of his life. What did Christ say to him? We covered this in the, the last uh, Four Winds show. He said, today you shall be with me in paradise. So, there you have it. And also, uh, Luke 10, 19, having power over all of our enemies, including Satan. That's right. We have the power to tread on. Be sure and send them back to where they came from. Yeah, when you cast one out, in the name and authority of Jesus Christ, cast them out of this earth age back to where they came from. Use the power that Christ has given you as a Christian, as a disciplined one in the Word of God. So now, uh, Rock Hard's going to cover um, Murmuring Against God, our next subject. Yeah, we sure will. Thank you, Bruce, and thank you, Mark. Let's get on to it. Okay. <clears throat> so our next subject, which was what you said, was Murmuring Against God. All through the Bible, we have seen the children of Israel murmur against God, despite all that he had done for them in freeing them from bondage of Egypt and taking care of them in the wilderness before their enemies and prophecies of man, which do now and shall even in the future murmur against God. But now, let's go and we will read some of these times when Israel defied God and, that they, and then that they murmured against him. So, um, get your Bible. Let's go to Exodus 16, verse 1, and it reads, And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of Sin, which was between Elam and Sinai. And on the fifteenth day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt, verse 2, and the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. I must say these are a special type of people, uh, specifically chosen. It doesn't get, I have to say, much dumber than these people. Not meaning to offend, but you will see their actions. Verse 3, And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full, for we have brought us forth into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Israel whined and showed lack of faith in God, even after all God had done for them. Rather than being thankful and, you know, giving him praise and thanks for delivering him from, you know, being slaves. Slavery. Um, God pulling them through that, um, that Red Sea and against the army and no big deal to God because nothing's any big deal to our Heavenly Father. He can do anything at any time. Yeah, and all you have out of these is a bunch of whiners. Right. Oh, you oh, brought you us out here in the desert just to let us die of hunger in the wilderness. What a cruel God you are to us. How could you do that to us? 
like our Heavenly Father, you know, as he did, he had manna fall from the sky because he could do anything. Exactly. exactly. Continuing with verse 4. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, listen to what God's going to do. I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them like God needs to prove anything. But like I said, I, this is a good example. Whether they will walk in my law or no. This, this The word there would be better translated test them rather than prove. Because in showing their weakness, God wanted to know how they were going to stand up, whether they're going to obey his law or not. Verse 5. And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. Verse 6. And Moses and Aaron said unto the children of Israel, And even then ye shall know that the Lord hath brought you out from the land of Egypt. 7. And in the morning then ye shall see the glory of the Lord, for that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. And what are we? that ye murmur against us. That, of course, was Moses and Aaron speaking when they said, What are we that you murmur against us? It was God that brought you out of the land of Egypt. It was God that chose us to be his speaker and his high priest. And here you are murmuring against us. All we've done is what God said and delivered you out of bondage, which you hated, which you whined to the Lord for. Good point, Bruce. Verse 8. And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, for that the Lord heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. Exactly. exactly. They're murmuring against the Lord and murmuring against Moses and Aaron. Because Moses has chosen these two, much like he will cho choose the two witnesses of the end times. I mean, God, I mean God, that is to say, God will choose, ha had chosen these two, and much like he will choose the two witnesses of the end times, it's going to be the same thing all over again. People are going to hate them. People are going to revile them. And these people did not understand. You know... These children of Israel uh, of this time period were not exactly the sharpest crayons in the box, if you ask me. Agreed. Um, continuing. Verse 9. And Moses spake unto Aaron, Say unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he hath heard your murmurings. 10. And it came to pass, as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. 11. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, 12. I have heard the murmuring of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying, At even ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with the bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. 13. And it came to pass that at even the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay round about the host. 14. And when the dew that, that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoar frost on the ground. And of Verse course, this would this be way. the manna. manna which the word manna simply means, what is it? They didn't they know didn't what know to what call it. it. Angel's food. Exactly. exactly. Verse 15. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, for they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. And still they're in disbelief. 16. This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded, gather of it every man according to his eating, and Omar for every man according to the number of your persons. Take ye every man for them which are in his tents. Verse 17. And the children of Israel did so, and gathered, some more, some less. 
18. And when they did meet it within Omar, he that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. Okay. Okay. I want to interject here. What is this manna symbolic of? Well, again, it is symbolic of that bread of life. As you read on in this, uh, past verse 20 or so, uh, they gathered it every morning. In other words, this was your daily bread. And every man was full according to his eating. And when the sun wa uh, waxed hot, it melted. In other words, if you don't stay in your father's word, it, it kind of melts out of your hands. This is one reason why it was called, the, the, the first time something was called the daily bread. And they were fed daily with manna which is to say angels' food, but where did it come from? From our Father in heaven. Well, when he gave us Yahshua, which is to say Jesus Christ, what did he give us? He gave us the bread of life. And we see a type and example in this of that exact thing through this manna. Yeah, that's right. Jesus Christ being the living word, and we are to get in that word every single day, not just give 45 minutes to him on, you know, on a Sunday morning. We give every day to him. There should be nothing more important in our lives than, than serving our Heavenly Father and pleasing him in every way that we can by planting seeds and studying his word and, and sharing what we've learned. And... Well said. Continuing with verse 19 of Exodus 16. And Moses said, Let no man leave of it till the morning. Verse 20. Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto Moses, but some of them left of it until the morning, and it bred worms and stank, and Moses was wroth with them. And you know, in the end times, uh, it's gonna. If you're waiting for, you know, the first Christ, the false Christ, if you're not studied in Father's Word, you're gonna fall to him, and and that's it's gonna stink, and it's gonna bred worms, because uh, we are to get in His Word now and know ahead of time. Very good. Verse twenty-one. Last verse to complete. And they gathered it every morning, every man according to his eating. And when the sun waxed hot, it melted. And again, that's the point I was making. In other words, they gathered it every morning. The first thing they did every morning was to go out. And if they uh, left it out there, it bred worms and stank. Well, what happens to your father's word if you don't open it up and read it? Of course, the word does not rot and stink, but uh, uh, by a spiritual example, to those who are uh, spiritually blind, it stinks because they don't know it. They don't understand it. And when they try to understand it, it makes no sense to them. So take it on the spiritual level intended rather than on the literal, and you'll see much deeper into this. And to document what you were saying earlier, let me read real quick. Uh, John six forty eight, where Christ says, I am that bread of life. 49, your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. 50, this is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. That's exactly right. You, you're an overcomer. You got in this word ahead of time. You're not going to fall to Satan. You're not going to fall to those any of those trials. Christ foretold us. He expected us to read it. And when we do that, we receive that eternal life. We know that those that do fall to Satan, are, their salvation is based off their works in the millennium. Exactly. And I'll tell you what else. That's one reason why we do the ceremony of Holy Communion. You know, a lot of people think, well, that's silly, you know, to take Holy Communion, but what are we partaking of? Well, it, it's symbolic that we're partaking of that unleavened bread, the bread of life. And we're partaking of the wine. In other words, Christ's blood shed on the cross, the fruit of the vine, which fattens us up and makes us able to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord because we have the truth within us. And what's that? That's that gospel armor, that spiritual armor that we put on, having that seal of God in our foreheads, knowing the knowledge and having that wisdom that our Heavenly Father 
bestows unto us to be able to stand that spiritual armor because that battle in the end times is being a battle because there is that famine for the word of God. So we stand that fighting against the spiritual um, side. And that's why we partake of that bread daily. Not weekly, not only on Sunday, not on Wednesday night at Potluck Supper, but daily. If you partake of your Father's Word daily, you will become so familiar with it that you cannot be deceived. And this is Christ's promise to us. Now we're going to pick it up in Numbers chapter 14. And uh, verse 1. And the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and all the people wept that night. Why? Well, because they're not going to be in, uh, in, allowed to enter the promised land. Verse 2. And all the children murmured against God and Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would to God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God that we had died in this wilderness, Verse 3, Wherefore hath the Lord brought us in, unto this land, to fall by the Lord, that our wives and children should be prey? Were it not better for us to return to Egypt? Verse 4, And they said one to another, Let us make a captain, and let us return to Egypt. In other words, Israel is now in rebellion against God, and against Moses and Aaron, but moreover against God. Why have you led us out here in the desert just to kill us or to be overcome by some army, especially these giants? Verse 15. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. Verse 6. And Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, in other words, that went through the land of Canaan, rent their clothes. In anger, that is to say. They, they, they were super angry with the children of Israel because of their lack of faith shown to God and the spinelessness of Israel. Verse 7. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceedingly good land. Verse 8. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into the land and give it to us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Verse 9, Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Uh, in other words, basically, we'll chew them up and spit them out. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. In other words, you Israelites, do you not remember what just happened to the land of Egypt to free us? Do you not remember the parting of the Red Sea? Do you not remember seeing God in the pillar of smoke and in the fire by night to light the camp? Do you not remember the manna and the quail and the water from the stone? I mean, what is with you people? God is with us. We can take them, verse 10. But all the congregation bade stone them. In other words, they wanted to stone them with stones. And, and this is symptomatic of what happens whenever you speak and teach the truth. Remember what they wanted to do at Christ at first before they crucified him. The scribes and Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, took up stones to uh, throw at him and, and kill him. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. Verse 11. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere, that is to say, until they believe me? In other words, what have I got to do? For all the signs which I have showed among them? In other words, I've heard of people that were slow on the uptake, but you guys are ridiculous. Verse 12. I will smite them with pestilence, and disinherit them, and will make thee a greater nation and mightier than they. In other words, he's talking to Moses here. Verse 13, And Moses said unto the Lord, Then the Egyptians shall hear it. For thou broughtest us up this people, and thy might from among them. In other words, 
Those Gentiles that we left behind are going to hear about this. Verse 14. And they will tell it to the inhabitants of, the, of this land. In other words, of the land of Canaan. For they have heard that thou, Lord, are among this people. That thou, Lord, art seen face to face. And that thy cloud standeth over them. In other words, to protect them. And that thou goest before them by the daytime in a pillar of a cloud and in a pillar of fire by night. In other words, to light them. A cloud to protect them from the heat during the day and lead them. And fire by night to light them. In other words, so they can see. This is one of the reasons why God is called the light of the world. And, and the same with Emmanuel, who is God with us. Jesus is the light to the world. Verse 15. Now if thou shalt kill all this people as one man, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, verse 16, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land which he swore unto them, therefore he has slain them in the wilderness. Verse 17. And now I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great, according to thou hast spoken, as thou hast spoken, saying, verse 18, the Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. Now, this is simply a manner of speech. It is a Hebraism. It means if the children continue to the third or fourth generation, in the sins of the fathers. We know very well that God does not visit the sins of the fathers upon his son or his grandson or his great-grandson. This means if they continue in the same way as their great-grandfather. And again, there is no word for grandfather or great-grandfather in the Hebrew. Verse 19. Pardon. In other words, forgive them, Father. I beseech thee. For the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of thy mercy. In other words, forgive them according to the ability that you have to forgive. And as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even till now. In other words, you put up with them this long, Father. Forgive them as you have done so far. Because even when they were not even yet crossed the Red Sea and the Egyptians were after them, they were already murmuring against God. Verse 20. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. Verse 21, But truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Verse 22, Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice. Verse 23, they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers. In other words, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And, and even the uh, patriarchs of the tribes. Neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. In other words, let this be a lesson to you never to provoke God. Because this promised land is a type to us of eternal life. In other words, of heaven. Verse 24. But my servant Caleb, because he hath another spirit. In other words, he had a faithful spirit. He was not a doubter. You could even say he carried with him the Holy Spirit. With him, and hath followed me fully. In other words, he's got a faithful spirit with him and has followed me fully. He has not doubted me. Him I will bring into the land whereinto he went, and his seed shall possess it. In other words, Caleb's safe. He's going to get to go into the land. And we also know that Joshua, the son of Nun, would, as a matter of fact, he would lead the children of Israel in after the death of Moses, or whatever Moses' fate was. Verse 25. Now the Amalekites, which are the children of Esau, and the Canaanites dwelt in the valley. Tomorrow, turn you, and get you into the wilderness by way of the Red Sea. In other words, turn yourselves around and go back to Kadesh. Go back into the wilderness of sin. You're not going into that promised land. Verse 26. And the Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying, Verse 27. 
how long shall I bear with? That is to say, how, how long shall I have to tolerate this evil congregation, which murmur against me? I have heard their murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me. You know, God is the heart knower. He, he, he even knows what you're thinking, let alone when you're speaking it. Verse 28. Say unto them, as truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do unto you. In other words, you were afraid to go into the land of Canaan because of those big, terrible giants. And you were afraid to go because your children were going to be made of prey and you were going to be carcasses all over the place. In other words, you doubted me. So as you have said, so shall it be done to you. Verse 29. Your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness. And all that were numbered of you, according to the whole number from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me, verse 30, doubtless ye shall not come up into the land, and again, that's the promised land, concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. The only two that were allowed to enter into the promised land of those that left out of Egypt. Why? because they showed faith unto God, they did not whine, and they were brave because they knew that God was with them. And Joshua even being a type of that Yahshua, Jesus Christ, which leads us into the promised land of eternal life. Verse 31. But your little ones, that is to say your children, your offspring, which he said should be a prey, them will I bring in. And they shall know the land which ye have despised. In other words, you despised it because you feared it, because you doubted me. Verse 32. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness. Verse 33. And your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years, and of course forty being the number of probation. In other words, a probationary period. And bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. In other words, until all this generation that doubted him and spake against him and showed lack of faith in God have died off. Verse 34. Even after the number of days which he searched in the land, in other words, the, the uh, sons that had gone into the land had searched for 40 days. Even 40 days, each day for a year, shall, be for, shall you bear for your iniquities, even 40 years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. In other words, you're going to know that I had to break my promise with you. Because I promised to take you into the land, but you caused this to happen. You caused me to breach my promise. And that is something you never want to have to make the Lord do. In other words, the Lord promises us all eternal life if we will turn from our wicked ways and seek his face and counsel and repent of our sins and worship him. But if you don't do that, then, hey, the contract is broken. Verse 35. I, the Lord, have said, I will surely do it unto this evil congregation that are gathered together against me, even after all that he'd done for them, in the wilderness, and they shall be consumed, and there they shall die. Verse 36. And the men which Moses sent out to search the land who returned and made all the congregation to murmur against him by bringing up slander upon the land, in other words, by telling these tales of woe. Verse 37. Even those men that did bring up the evil report of the land died by the plague before the Lord. In other words, the Lord put a plague upon them. They didn't even have to wait to die. They didn't even have to wander around for 40 years. Verse 38. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of the men that went to search out the land, lived still. In other words, God added to their lives so that they would be able to enter into the land. Or either that or they were young men at the time in the first place. Verse 39. And Moses told these sayings unto all the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly, and of course they would mourn greatly. They had been promised the promised land. Well, I want you to take a type from this, because there are people this day which think they're headed for the promised land, which is to say heaven and glory bound, 
And they're going to make a big mistake by not studying our Father's Word. And they're going to fall and worship the Antichrist. And when they do that, they're going to breach the promise. And then when the true Christ returns, they're going to pray for the mountains to fall on them. And they're go there's going to be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Most people take that to mean pain. But what it really means is they're going to be so embarrassed to face the Lamb, that is to say Jesus Christ, Yeshua, that they're going to pray for the mountains to fall on them. So anyway, now Mark is going to continue with uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 on the same subject. Yep, murmuring against God. Here we go with 2 Peter chapter 3. The second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us the apostles, of the Lord and Savior. That's the Old and the New Testament. Well, I thought the Old Testament was done away with. Well, you're wrong, because here Peter is talking about it and referring to it. As all the apostles and Christ did all throughout the book, the New Testament, that is. Verse 3, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, Walking after their own lusts. You ever seen anybody like that? And when's the last days? You're living in them, Jack. Because uh, in 1948 began the final generation, the generation of the fig tree. So they're walking after their own lusts and their own beliefs even. They're self-absorbed to the nth degree. Which, is it anything new? Well, no, because we just read about what happened in the wilderness. After God had talked to them and delivered them out of Egypt, I mean, they saw all this. They went through the Red Sea after it was parted and everything. And still, it's kind of, it's almost unbelievable that that would be their attitude after all that. But that's, people are people. Verse 4, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. They say, where is Christ coming? Nothing's changed since the beginning. Well, is it the generation of the fig tree or not? Yeah, it is. You ever heard of Israel? 1948, that's what started it. Verse 5, for this they willingly are ignorant of. Oh, did they just not know any better? No, they're willingly ignorant. You start talking to them about it, and they zone right out. It's it's amazing to watch. That by the word of God, this is what they're willingly ignorant of. And this is really common sense. That by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, in the first earth age. Whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. And why did this happen? Because of Satan's rebellion. You can also read about it in Jeremiah chapter 4. But think about it. Why would God create the land underneath the water? Because, go back to Genesis chapter 1, and there it is right there. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, period. Didn't say when. We don't know how much time is in between those two verses. Some people call it a gap theory. It's not a gap theory. It says what it says. Yeah, yeah, it could even be billions of years. Yeah. I mean, we know that there are fossils and a fossil record that go far back into history or, or prehistory even. And uh, l look at the canyons that have been uh, whittled down over many uh, millennia, many eons of time. You know, the, the earth is vastly older than people think. There, there are even Christians now these days that still teach that old idea that the earth is no more than 7,000 years old. And that's, that's just silly, you know? Yeah, they're willingly ignorant. Yeah, there you go. Verse 7, But the heavens and the earth, which are now, that's the second earth age, that's the earth age we're living in now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Now, that's not the flood of Noah 
from Genesis chapter 6 because Noah's flood happened in this earth and heaven age. It quite clearly just stated that the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, the word of God, are reserved until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men from Satan right down to those that follow him. And it's quite clearly stated in the previous verse, the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. as the catabole, the overthrow, when Satan tried to overthrow God. God was more than just a little bit upset about it, and instead of destroying a third of his children, he destroyed that earth age and created this one. And that's why you're here to make up your mind whether you're going to love God or Satan or somebody else. Yeah, where that's why went. we have no memory of that. Yeah. We have no memory of those events. Because we're in the flesh. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. Well, is this something we need to know? Well, it says be not ignorant of this one thing. I would say so. That one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So you see what he's getting at here. The millennium is what comes after. It begins when the true Christ returns at the seventh trumpet. So you got that buffer zone there where they're really going to have a chance because he really, really, really doesn't want to have to kill any of his children that he created. The next verse states so. Verse 9. The, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, for not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And there you have it. There's the will of God right there, that none should perish. It's what he wants. He doesn't want to have to destroy his children. And I, I don't see what else he could do. I mean, a thousand years on top of a whole flesh life, you know? Verse 10, but the day of the Lord, that's the millennium, will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. That's the works that are therein. It's written that the Lord comes as a thief in the night because everybody will think he's already here. They're going to think Satan's Jesus. So it's going to come as quite a surprise when the true Jesus shows up like a thief because that's the last thing they're going to expect. And Satan will be here as Antichrist claiming to be Jesus' return. So, so nobody will be on the watch for the thief in the night. As Christ told us in Matthew 24, verses 32 through 51. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, that's the evil rudiments, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, the millennium, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements all the defends rudiment things shall melt with fervent heat nevertheless we according to his promise look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness just as it is written in revelation chapter 22 wherefore beloved seeing that ye look for such things be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot without blemish that is to say and blameless, be steadfast and hold to the truth. Do your best. We're going to mess up at times. It's it's unavoidable, but uh, all you got to do is repent and keep moving on forward. It's going to happen. But do your best to, you know, not do anything wrong. You're going to. But when you slip up, just have, apologize. In Christ's name, and it's erased from next to your name where the record's kept. And you don't want to be embarrassed when you have to answer for it, you know. Verse 15, an account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. 
even as our beloved brother Paul, also con according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, to warn you. Now, there he is giving Paul credentials. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, you know, a lot of people say Peter and Paul were at odds with each other, and uh, this, that, and the other, but uh, maybe in a few minor things, but not when it comes to the big stuff. But uh, it's it's said quite queerly that um, in the end times they're going to come scoffers. Well, a, as we saw, as you stated earlier, Mark, um, look at the children of Israel. What a hard-headed people. I mean, if you go through and read uh, the books of Samuel and Chronicles and Kings, you're going to see Israel fall away from God so many times. And once once every few generations, a king would rise up and he would get rid of the grove worship and the Baal idols and this, that, and the other. But Israel, you know, you know and this is something that I've said a number of times in, uh, in my own lectures, there is no disgrace in not being of Israel. You know, a lot of people write me on the Lost Tribes of Israel Revealed and, and say, you're, you're trying to lift yourself up. You know, you're trying to say that you're better than anyone else, you know, because you're an Israelite or whatever. And, and that, that is not the case. I mean, more often than not in the Bible, the Gentiles were more accepting of God's word than, than sottish, stiff-necked Israel were. So you've got these scoffers and this murmuring, and it even goes on today. I mean, Christians, which are uh, weak spine, shall I say, uh, uh, delicate little flowers, the first thing that happens to them that's wrong, God hates me, or, or if they lose someone in their life, a, a loved one, a mother, brother, sister, father, whatever, they're angry at God. You know? And if, the, if they knew the joy and pleasure that their loved one was most likely experiencing being back with God, they would not feel that way. But people are selfish, and we are in the flesh. And as I said earlier, we only have about 15 to 18% of our cognitive ability. We don't see things as fully as we should. So um, you've got murmurers and scoffers in these end times. You've got your atheists, and you've got your alternative lifestyleists and uh, you've even got I, I, I shudder to say this but socialist churches you know socialist Christian well, you, you, that, that in itself is an oxymoron there's no such thing as a socialist Christian I mean look what socialism brings Look, it, it, it actually sets the stage for communism I know there's some that would not believe that, and that's the twoof for sure, but uh, at any rate, we see all of these scoffers and these murmurers, and um, we've seen them all down through biblical history, and they've been given to us as types and examples so that we would know what not to do. In other words, they're like reverse barometers from us. Kind of like Saul. He was a great example of what not to do. Yeah, well, I mean, Saul started off good with a good heart, and, and most Christians start off with a good heart, but it's so easily, or, or so easy for man to get turned around, to get caught up in earthly things, to get caught up in life, and just the least little thing happens to them. You know, it, 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 there's a hailstorm, and it ruins their new Camaro. And, and God did that to purpose on me, or did that to me on purpose. You know, when it's a thing that happens. You know, there's always going to be murmurs. That's that's all there is to it. Yeah, I have a friend that uh, his grandma passed away, and he's been mad at God ever since. This was like ten years ago. And I said, "Hey, man, if you would un if you would read and understand the word, you'd understand that it, you must be mad at somebody for it." Why don't you get mad at Satan? Because isn't it his fault for rebelling? Everything was hunky-dory until he rebelled. So if you must hate somebody because of anything that happens in this earth age, well, there you go. Yeah, I mean, Satan is the one that caused this earth age to happen in the first place and caused us to be put in these nasty, 
perishable flesh bodies which get old and which stink and which, which pollute and which uh, rot away. We lose our teeth and lose our hair and people get fat and, you know, it, 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 yeah. and not only that, they're very painful. So, you know, blame Satan for all of that. Don't blame God. God is the author of peace and the author of eternal life. And, you know, you may be mad at God now, but uh, when you face him, you sure want to have repented for that so that when you're young again and you're in your spiritual body that you won't have anything held against you, but you'll have uh, raiment of white and, and treasures laid up in store in heaven. Anyway, now we're going to look at our... Uh, final study in this discussion and it's kind of going to mint some of these things together the final study is the fallen angels which is to say the Nephilim or Nephilim and the Giants and again we're gonna cover some of the three subjects that we've been covering in this uh, episode in these scriptures that we're going to read so we're going to begin in Genesis chapter 6 here and uh, this would happened this would take place during the time of Noah and uh, as Christ said it will be just like it was in the time of Noah at the end so you want to take a cue from this so Genesis chapter 6 and verse 1 and it came to pass when men began to or when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them in other words God created the womb for this earth age verse 2 that the sons of God saw the daughters of men. Now, why is there that um, delineation between the two? Why doesn't it say the sons of God saw the daughters of God or the sons of men saw the, da the daughters of men? Well, if you'll go read the book of Job, you'll find out that the sons of God and the stars of heaven are one and the same. These are your fallen angels, the sons of God. They saw the daughters of men. In other words, in heaven there are no uh, women per se. There are no females. The womb was created for this age, and so was the woman. And God made woman very beautiful. I mean, I know any of you that have ever been in love or have just seen a woman and had your eyes pop out of your head and your jaw hit the ground and your heart pop out of your chest know what I'm talking about. But uh, these sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. And they took them to wives, all of whom they chose. And of course, as compared to a human male, uh, uh, an angelic coming down, the women seeing them would just go, ooh, ooh got to have me some of that. I mean, by comparison, we're like filthy rags to angels. So verse 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. In other words, this would be about the time when God started shortening man's lifespan from some of those very long ages that we read uh, previous to this in the Bible. Verse 4. And there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that the sons of God came in to the daughters of men and bare children unto them. The same men became mighty men, or the same became mighty men. Now, uh, which were of old, men of renown. Uh, we need to do some work here with these words. First of all, we need to check out the word giants. It is the word nephil of the word nephal, which is what makes up the word nephilim. And when it comes to the word mighty men, we need to go and check out the word gibor. So we're going to look at these words now, and they'll be put up on your screen. The word giants here in Hebrew is H. That is Hebrew from your Strong's Concordance, 5303, 5303, Nafil, which means a feller, in other words, as in one that fell, a bully, a tyrant, a giant. It is from word... H5307, which is Napa, or Nepal, which means to be cast down, to fall, to fall away, to be overthrown. In other words, there you've got the first part of your uh, 
word, nephil. And then if you add M to it, you get nephilim. And I'll explain what the M does for the word in just a moment. The next word we need to look at is mighty man or mighty men. This is words H1368 in your Hebrew concordance of the Strong's Concordance. It is the word Gibar. It is an intensive word from 1367. It means to be powerful, to be a tyrant, to be a warrior, to be a mighty man, to be a strong man, which the giants were. And also, they were mighty men of renown because they possessed knowledge which they should not have had being hybrids, in other words, being half angelic and half human. And this word, 1367, has an offshoot word from it, H1396, Gebar, which means to be strong, to be mighty, to prevail, to put more of strength, and of course with the particle added to it that I had just spoken of, that is Yim at the end of it, at the end of the word nephilim, in other words, nephilim, it means angelic. How do we know this? Well, if you check out the word Elohim, it means God and the angels. And you will see this uh, word yim, I am at the end, I'm pronouncing it yim as though it had a Y in front of it because that is the pronunciation. But you will see it in other chapters of the Bible when giants are mentioned as a people, such as the Anakims, or you more properly pronounced An Anakims, or the Emims, or the Zamzimims, or the Kaphtarims, or the Raphims, or even Seraphim. And this is also the root of why the word Nethanim was called by what it's called. In other words, the Nethanim are, of course, your Kenites, which were fathered by Satan, who is the primo fallen angel. And, of course, they have a little bit of that angelic strain in them, though they are not giants, which is to say uh, Geber hybrids. But they are called by that name for a reason. Most any name you see in the Bible that ends with I-M has to do with fallen angels. Now, this is not the case in every... Uh, instance because the word Ephraim or Ephraim also ends in I am but it has no particle with this. But these Nethanim were called by that name again because they were the sons of Satan. In other words, Kenites, the sons of Cain. Now we're going to go back to Genesis chapter 6 and pick it up where we had left off with verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. In other words, these fallen angels and the giants had corrupted the people. Verse 6. And it repented the Lord that he had made man flesh on the earth. In other words, God was sorry that he had put man into the flesh. I've noted a number of times that the flesh can bring out the worst in us or it can bring out the best in us. And it grieved him at his heart. In other words... God was really sorry that he had put man in this nasty carnal flesh. But he did, to test us. Again, it brings out the best in some of us, and in others it brings out the worst in us. And that's what this flesh age is about. It is a test. Verse 7. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from off the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing, and fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. In other words, in the flesh. Verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In other words, Noah found unmerited favor in the eyes of the Lord. However, the favor was really not so much unmerited because Noah had not, with his family, partaken of these generations. In other words, they had not partaken of the fallen angels nor the giants. Verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man. In other words, he was just in the eyes of God and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. In other words, Noah followed God as man should. Now we need to check out this word generations. This word generations is H 
8435, Tauvida, of H3205, Yalad. And both of these words mean descendants, or pedigree, or offspring, or to bring forth children. In other words, Noah was perfect in his generations. He was perfect in his offspring, in the children that he had brought forth, and their wives. Why? Because they had not partaken of the fallen angels or the seed of the Nephilim, which is to say the fallen angels or the giants. And this is why Noah was perfect in his generations. His seed line had not been corrupted. This influx of fallen angels were attempting to corrupt the seed line through which Christ would eventually come. That was the whole purpose and why they did it, and that was the whole purpose why Satan came here and beguiled Eve and bore a child unto her which would be Cain. But God allowed that because the Kenites, the children of Cain, would fulfill the negative part of God's plan in all that they accomplished down through the ages. So let's pick it up now in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 10. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Verse 11. And the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Verse 12. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. And all the flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Turned away from God. Verse 13. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them. In other words, through, through those that dwell in the flesh. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Now, of course, we know that God did not destroy the planet. In other words, we're talking about um, the uh, terra firma here. We're not talking about the actual planet itself. And this word earth, if you go and look it up in the Hebrew, can take on many com uh, connotations. It can be the entire planet. It can be a region. It can be a small plot of land, an allotment of land. Uh, there's no telling about the flood of Noah, whether it was actually worldwide, as most have been taught and believe, or whether it was just a certain area. But uh, the aim here was to get rid of that seed line of the fallen angels, which God did accomplish. Verse 14. And this is God's word to Noah. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms thou shalt make in the ark, and thou shalt pitch it. In other words, you're going to make pitch, like tar, to uh, put between the boards so that no water seeps in. With it and without with pitch. In other words, the inside and the outside. You're going to make this thing watertight. Verse 15. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. The length of the ark shall be three hundred cubits. And a cubit was roughly the uh, distance from the end of the fingers to the elbow, according to the man. And the breadth thereof fifty cubits, and the height thereof thirty cubits. In other words, it's going to be about three stories tall. Verse 16. A window shalt thou make in the ark. And in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. And the door of the ark shalt thou set inside thereof, with lower, second, and third stories. Again, there you go, three stories. Thou shalt make it. Verse 17. And behold, I, even I, do bring floodwaters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein there is breath of life. In other words, wherein there is nephesh, or soul. From under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. And again, this could be just in a certain region. Again, the word earth is the particle that makes the difference here. But whether you believe it was the worldwide flood or just a certain area, it matters not. God's will was performed. Verse 18. But with thee I will establish my covenant. And thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons, and thy wife, and thy sons' wives, with thee. Verse 19. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark, to keep them alive with thee. And they shall be male and female. And if you check out this word flesh, you'll find some interesting connotations about what I was talking about, because this flesh can't even mean human flesh. 
Suppose maybe of the races, maybe. At any rate, that matters not. We know that they made it through the, fl uh, through the flood somehow. Verse 20. Or fowls after their kind, or cattle after their kind, of every, er, I should have said of in front of those, not or, of fowls after their kind, of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind. Two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. Verse 21. Take thou unto thee all the food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and that shall be for food to thee and for them. In other words, take enough food to feed the animals and yourselves. Verse 22. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. And we know that the flood did come, as the flood of the end times shall come, as written in the book of Revelation, and killed all the, those uh, fallen angels. And it's ironic that fallen angels will be killed in the book of Revelation as well, 7,000 of them. Probably not an exact number, but uh, the negative of the 7,000 elect. But God did save Noah and his family. And he saved them by means of water. Isn't that another interesting concept? They were saved by water. And again, what is the living water? So you've got so many spiritual connotations here, which you should be able to see. So now, Rockhart is going to take us and uh, visit number 13. And this is going to take us back before what I've already read in Numbers 14. In other words, yeah. here you're going to see the reason that God got so mad at the Israelites when they murmured against him. So take it away, Rock Hart. Um, right before that, you're talking about the flood, the flood of the end times. And I just want to point out that it's going to be that spiritual uh, slaying that happens when people worship take Satan and they take the mark of the beast in doing so. They take him as their God. And that's why we are to take part of the living word daily um, as it builds our spiritual, spiritual arc, which is, I mean, our spiritual armor, which is our arc to get us out of Satan's flood of lies that is coming upon the whole world when the whole world is deceived into thinking that he is um, Christ. Yeah but, yeah, but you don't want to confuse that with uh, people thinking that our ark is the rapture. I mean, that's that's where people make their biggest mistake right there is thinking, oh, well, there's going to be a rapture and we're not going to have to worry about any of that. Yeah, that's the spiritual armor, meaning putting on that seal of God in our foreheads, having the wisdom that Father gives us to understand his word, um, to know the, you know, the events that are going to come to pass before Christ's return and that there's, an, there's no rapture in any part of that. Um, Satan comes first, after that Christ comes, and Christ comes and he stays on, on the earth. Um, exactly. exactly. Now, to set this up before you begin reading this, this is going to be when God speaks to Moses here in the first verse, this is going to be when they have come to the border of the land of Canaan. In other words, they've trudged through the desert now, not for 40 years yet. This is before that point. They have come straight from Egypt over, and they would have entered into the land of Canaan had they only obeyed God and not murmured against him and not showed lack of faith. But they did. So I've already read Numbers 14. You already know the end result, that they were not allowed to enter into the promised land until 40 years had passed and all that generation had died off. But in reading this Numbers chapter 13, we're going to see what happened previous to chapter 14. And we're also going to see some interesting types and examples. So Numbers 13 and verse 1, and it reads, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send now men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Take note, the Lord said, I give unto them. Okay? When the Lord says that he's, he's made the way straight for you, or he's done something, it's set in stone, and, and um, it's no, no big deal. Okay? Of every tribe of their fathers shall you send a man, every one a ruler among them. Verse 3. And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them, from the wilderness of Paran, all those men were the heads of the children of Israel. And these were their names of the tribe of Reuben, Shammuah, the son of Zachar, 
of the tribe of Simeon, Shaphat, the son of Hori, of the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, of the tribe of Issachar, Igal, the son of Joseph, of the tribe of Ephraim, Oshea, which is Joshua, meaning salvation, the son of Nun, of the tribe of Benjamin, Paltai, the son of Rephu, of the tribe of Zebulun, Gadiel, the son of Sodai, of the tribe of Joseph, namely of the tribe of Manasseh, Gadai, the son of Suzai, of the tribe of Dan, Amiel, the son of Gimeli, of the tribe of Asher, Sether, the son of Michael, of the tribe of Nephtali, Nabai, the son of Bosai, Shai, of the tribe of Gad, Yehuel, the son of Mekai. These are the names of the men which Moses sent to spy out of the land. And Moses called Oshia, or Joshua, the son of Nun, Jehoshua, or Yeshua. Which, of course, is the same name as our Lord. 17. And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, and said unto them, Get, up, get you up this way southward, and go up into the mountain. And see the land, what it is, and the people that dwell therein, whether they be strong, weak, few, or many. And again, the Lord already said that he would go before him. doesn't matter how strong or, or who is there in this land. God is the creator. He's way stronger. He, he brought them out of the land of Egypt. He parted that Red Sea. He gave them manna. He gave them the quail. He gave them the water. He set them up really, really good. Um, so it doesn't matter who is in the land. Our Father's got it under control. 19. And what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities they be that they dwell in, whether in tents or strongholds, and what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether it be wood therein or not, and be ye of a good courage and bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. 21. So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rehob, as the as men come unto Hamath. 22. And they ascended by the south and came unto Hebron, where Ahiman and Jeshai and Talmai, the children of Anak, were. Okay, so now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And look at that word, Anak. We'll get to it in a little bit. Um, Bruce made note on the Anak. And the Anakim, being the, the Geber. 23. And they came under the brook of Eshkol, and cut down from hence a branch from one of the cluster of grapes, and they bare it bet between two upon a staff, and they brought up pomegranates and of the figs. And the place was called the brook of Eshkol, because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down from thence. And they returned from searching of the land after forty days. 26. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran, to Kadesh, and brought back word unto them unto all the congregation and showed them of the fruit of the land, which is to say the, the goodness that the land yielded. 27. And they told him and said, We come unto the land whether thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. So the land was as God promised him. 28. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there, Anakims, those giants. 29. And the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. 30. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are able to overcome it. And Moses said this because uh, Israel had God with him. And uh, that's that. 31. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And here Israel showed lack of faith in the power of God, even after witnessing the plagues on Egypt and the parting of the Red Sea and the the quail and the manna and the water. Um, 32. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land. 
through which we have gone to search it is a, is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw are men of great stature, and again the giants. 33. And there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. So we were small by comparison to them. We're, we're scared of them. Um, <laughs> all we have is God um, with us. They're tall and powerful. So again, they're showing that lack of faith in the power of God. And remember what just thoughts? Bruce just read Numbers 14 about murmuring. That is the text. That, that's in the next chapter. Of course, we can't forget little David going up against Goliath. Well, David, being a boy, had God with him. And this huge giant had no chance. Because when you have God with you, no one can stand against you. When you have our Heavenly Father, you have the victory. And continuing with the subject, fallen angels and giants. Here we go with the book of Jude. Verse 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you, and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints, those are the set-aside ones. Verse 4, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old, ordained to this condemnation ungodly men turning the grace of our god into lasciviousness and denying the only lord god and our lord jesus christ i wonder who that's talking about well we'll, well let's find out it's talking about the giants and uh i'll tell you what else it's the the fallen angels and uh you really could say it was talking about the entire locust army, including the Kenites, but uh, your clue right there is certain men crept in unawares who were of old ordained to this condemnation. Well, of old, we're talking about the first earth age there. And they're ungodly men. Now, just because it says men does not necessarily mean that that's human. Because Satan himself is called the son of perdition, and if you go look up the word Gabriel, who is also uh, a protecting cherubim, as Satan once was when he was Lucifer, his name means man of God. So you ought to be able to pick up on that. Yeah, as well as in Isaiah 14, is where he's called Lucifer. You know who that is. It's Satan, of course, and when he's locked up in like an animal at the zoo, during the millennium, people come by and look at him and say, is this the man You know that did all that, to, to paraphrase it? Just as yeah. another example. Is this the man that shook the nations? Yeah. Caused the earth to tremble? And not only that, there's another place where it's written, uh, I, I don't really recall it right now, but it, God said unto him, Thou shalt be a man and no God in the hands of them that slay thee. Ezekiel 28, I think. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, seems like that's right anyway. Where That's a good place to read if you're interested in finding out uh, why Satan is the son of perdition. Uh, because in, in that chapter, he's sentenced to die. Verse 5, I will therefore put you in remembrance. I want to remind you about all this. Though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, there they are again. Afterward, destroyed them that believed not. They murmured against God. One of our topics. And the angels. Now here we go. Which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. And there's those fallen angels again. Another and one of our topics. the great day there now. That's the day of the Lord. That's the day when they die. Right. And uh, what if you go to John chapter 3, it, when Christ says you must be born again, he means born from above. It's God's plan 
that all of us are born of woman and go through this earth age, but these angels, uh, they decided to go, like Bruce read in Genesis chapter 6, go get the daughters of Adam pregnant, uh, which was Satan's plan, not God's, and this is why they're going to be destroyed. They forfeited. There's no need that they even be judged. They threw away their opportunity right there. Verse 7, even as Sodom and Gomorrah, you remember what happened there, and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And they were an example of what God hates. And what happens when people go that route? Destroying yourself. Verse 8, likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh. Well, how did the fallen angels defile the flesh? By That's getting pregnant with a fallen angel baby is about as low as it gets. And Eve even was pregnant with Satan's baby. Well, what's worse than that? I think this also concerns the... Uh the uh, alternative lifestylers that defile their self, defile their flesh between one another. Yeah. Because we're, we're talking about the end times here, and we've had Sodom and Gomorrah set uh, as our example, uh, going after strange flesh. And of course, strange flesh is always flesh that is not natural. And we know that uh, the fallen angels do not have flesh. Yeah, one well, plus, unfortunately, uh, where Paul said a woman should have her her hair her head covered, and then where it says it's a shame for a man to have long hair, there's an allusion to that too. Uh, I hate to even talk about it, but they'll they'll have sex with them too. So there's your connection to that with these yeah. fallen angels. Pretty, pretty filthy, as it says here, filthy dreamers. Because what it means is a woman having her head covered, she'd have, she should have Christ uh, over her head. She should be it because of the angels is what it says. Yes. Um, and speak evil of dignities. Despise dominion. Despise the law and rule. And speak evil of dignities. That which is truth and which is righteous. Everything good. So doing everything that you're not supposed to do, basically. Completely. Complete debauchery here. Verse 9. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not, bringing, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Michael didn't argue with Satan. He rebuked him in the name of God, which is what you're to do. Don't try and argue with him. He's, you're in a flesh body with your little pea brain, and he's quite frankly smarter than you at this point. And, uh, yeah, it's written he's wiser than Daniel even, so, you know, D Daniel was pretty wise. Yeah. So, thank God we have power over him to get him away from us. But don't have a little conversation with him, because he'll he's been thinking about it for uh, quite some time now. We're talking thousands and thousands of years, uh, every possible way thing you could think of about the human psychology and then some. So just in in the name of Christ, just send them back to where they came from if you run into an evil spirit. And you most certainly will if, if you get into teaching truth or learning truth. Because that's, the, that'll get the snake pit riled up right there. So, verse 10, But these speak evil of those things which they know not. They speak evil of the truth they don't understand, so of course it must be evil, because it contradicts my brainwashing, I guess is what's going on in their head. Who knows? Uh, apparently nothing's going on in their head. But what they know naturally as brute beasts, flesh beings, in those things they corrupt themselves and can't think beyond that. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. And what's Cain's way? And to lie, to mislead, and to murder. In Matthew 23 and 
John chapter 8. There is a good place to document that. And what did Cain say after he murdered his brother Abel, his half-brother, I might add? Cain was the son of Satan. He said, it. God said, where's your brother Abel? And Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? And who would say something like that to God Almighty himself? I mean, so where did this attitude come from? He was of that wicked one. And ran greedily after the heir of Balaam, that false god worship, for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Cory. Men pleasing, soothsaying words of false doctrine like you'll hear in just about every so-called house of God nowadays. Verse 12, these are spots in your feast of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water. There's people being called clouds right there for all you uh, people that think you're going to float away in a cloud or whatever it is. Well, the the connotation also is when you see a cloud coming up, you expect rain. In our case, we expect the latter rain, but they're clouds without water. They're empty. There's nothing in them. And it's going to say they're carried about on the winds. In other words, they'll go with the flow. Yeah. Bunch of hot air. Yeah. Trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead. And you know what the second death is. Lake of fire. Which means you're blotted out of existence. Plucked up by the roots. Yeah, John chapter 3. Yeah, what did you say earlier about spots in your Feast of Charity? When they well, feast with you? Well, what I was saying is, in the old days of Israel, whenever you had a Feast of Charity, you, you took an animal and, and you offered it up to God and... Uh, Certain portions were given to the priests, and certain portions were given to the people. And they were unblemished animals. In other words, without spot. And um, these that we're talking about here, the ones that uh, teach false doctrine and teach all these fleshly ways, uh, will feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. In other words, they're not worried about it, but they're clouds without water. They're empty. They're carried about on the winds. They're trees without fruit. And um, as Christ and John the Baptist alluded to, by, by, your, by their fruit you shall know them. And any tree which bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. So that's what it means to be plucked up by the roots. Yep. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea. And remember what the sea is from the book of Revelation. It's the people, multitudes, nations, and tongues foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars. Stars are symbolic of God's children. Lost. It was the third that followed Satan in the, in the first earth age. So when you see about the dragon's tail drawing a third of the stars, that's what it's talking about. To whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Darkness, of course, always symbolic of being deceived or deception. And, of course, uh, when a soul is blotted out, it will know darkness forever because there will be no more life in it. No light, in other words. Verse 14, in Enoch also, the seventh from Adam. This is the seventh from Adam. There's two Enochs. One's Cain's first son. you got to watch them Kenites prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. So there you have it right there at the seventh trumpet. He brings an army with him, and he stays here forever. But then again, the Antichrist also, when he comes, is coming with his kings and his fallen angels, so it's going to look pretty much the same except for one major difference we will be in the flesh during the time that the antichrist is here i know a lot of people think they're going to fly away long before that happens but i'm afraid they've got quite a shock coming to them 
Yeah, that old phrase, looks can be deceiving, that's never going to be more true than at the sixth trumpet. Verse 15. To execute judgment upon all, and this this is what Christ is going to do when he gets here, and to convince all that are ungodly among them all of their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. He's going to teach them what they did wrong and teach them how to not go to hell because at this point they're spiritually dead from having worshipped the false Christ. So here, instead of uh, showing up and killing them immediately, he, he's a whole thousand years, and what's he going to be doing? Well, read that verse 15 again. That's basically what will happen during the millennium. Verse 16, these are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, man-pleasing words. Sounds real good, but it's the venom of asps. Having men's persons in admiration because of advantage, they're respecters of persons, panderers. It's not good to be a man-pleaser, be a god-pleaser. And that's not going to be popular, I'll go ahead and tell you right now. But that's the world in which we live. Verse 17, But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time, in the end times. There it is again. Who should walk after their own ungodly lusts? So look around, turn on the TV for about 30 seconds, and that this has come upon us and come to pass. Uh, just, you can do it right on the internet, buddy. <laughs> yeah. We just pray to look out your window these yeah. days. And the, the harvest is ripe. Verse 19. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, fleshly. It's all like they can't see past that they're in a you know, little human body. Having not the spirit, the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, and of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. And amen. And so there you've got it. Your fallen angels and your giants. And in this last chapter, your scoffers. And uh, the examples that we saw, in other words, this, this last uh, portion of this uh, episode devoted basically to all three subjects, save of the familiar spirits, which you, you could really say that they're involved with it too because they're part of the army of Satan. I mean, that they're uh, here to cause the spirit of delusion to be upon man. And, uh, and you can find out what happens to the, the fallen angels in Revelation eleven thirteen. Those are those 7,000 that are slain. Yeah, it, it's written they are men there too, but uh, if you will check into it, you will see that, uh, it, you know, most people are going to see that and read it in English and say, oh, it's, it's 7,000 men that are slain. But again, when have you ever read in the Bible of a female angel? That is only to let you know that they are male. I mean, again, Satan is called a man. Gabriel is called a man. These, these angels, likewise, are called men. And they don't even get the benefit of waiting to the judgment to be killed. Because God is so angry with them. Because, unlike man in the flesh, they knew what they were doing with full cognitive ability. In other words, they knew they were serving Satan. So, God is not going to put up with that. He, he won't tolerate that five minutes. So they're going to be destroyed at the return of Christ. At any rate, 
we're going to, uh, before we close out here, we're going to get into some questions and answers. And uh, I will start this off. And then uh, Mark will answer one. And then uh, Rock Hard will uh, answer their question or their set of questions. But uh, at any rate, these are questions that have uh, been written to us at some point on our videos on our websites or uh, some that we've received an email. And uh, if you would like to ask us some questions on these shows, then please feel free to uh, write us in comments or on our emails on YouTube or on GodTube or whatever you happen to be watching this on or listening to it on. Uh, Mark also has a uh, radio channel on the internet, and uh, he can tell you more about that later. But anyway, first question. Is God's name YHVH or YHWH? In other words, is it Yahweh or Yahweh? And um, to answer this question, you really have to go back to the ancient, ancient Hebrew. In other words, in ancient, which is what they call Paleo-Hebrew, there is no W. The letter is pronounced Vav, V, or Vav, V-A-U. It is not pronounced Wal, which is W-A-W. That is a uh, more modern-day translation with a little bit of English tinge added on to the... Uh, uh, New Median Hebrew. The translators of the King James Bible, which translated the name of God, translated it as Jehovah. Now, there is no J in Hebrew either, but they got it right. They did not pronounce it Jehovah. They pronounced it Jehovah. If you would like to prove to yourself what the name is, then go look at in your strong concordance at the word H3068 and you will see that it is Yahweh or Yehovah and I guess either way that you pronounce it there's no real uh, insult to our father uh, e even if you pronounce it Yahweh as long as you know who he is but you know for me I want to go with what he was called in ancient times by the ancient Hebrews the W is a more modern Hebrew interpretation. But uh, Psalms 119 will let you know that it is pronounced V because the entire Hebrew alphabet is given in Psalms 119. And it is there written in the King James Bible V-A-U. Uh, more properly, it would be V-A-V, V. -A -V Bob. But Bob will do. It still gives you the V sound. There is also an acrostic in Isaiah uh, 45, 18, which gives you the name of God as YHVH. It takes a little bit of digging to find that. And um, again, it was the more modern New Median Hebrew, which came about after the Babylonian captivity, and a little bit of help from the English, which gives us the W sound, and why most people say Yahweh today when it's actually Yahweh or Yehovah. And uh, 2 Samuel 18, 4, there is an acrostic which reads forwards and backwards the name of God, which is Y-H-V-H, Yehovah, Yehovah. So there you go with my first question. Uh, did all people come from Adam and Eve? No. Uh, we have other races. It's impossible that all the races came from uh, Adam and Eve and you'd have to it really do you a lot of good to go into the Hebrew with that too to learn the difference between Adam and Etha Adam the, there's a man just mankind the different races and then there's specific Etha Adam as in Adam and Eve and if you go back and read, he made, on the sixth day, the people that he made, which were all the races besides what race Adam was, he made them hunters and fishers. But then when he goes to make Adam, just before that, 
he doesn't have a man to till the soil. So that's the farmer. That's different. So there's a clear difference here. And on top of that, where did Cain's wife come from? You know, and who are all those people he was afraid of that were going to kill him? And so on and so forth. I go on for like 10 hours, but I'll leave it at that. Yeah, because quite frankly, I mean, th that is a long subject. But if, if you just take common sense, you've got Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. Cain kills Abel. So then Eve bears Seth. Now you've got three men and one woman on the earth. And it's written that Adam had other children. So, you know, it, it, it's very possible that um, Seth was forced to uh, practice incest, but that was before the law was given. But uh, it's also written that Cain went to the land of Nod, which would be uh, what some consider uh, the border of Eurasia to Mongolia. So, you know, you can go with that like you feel or how you feel led, but that is a very deep subject, very deep study. So let's see what... Uh, Let's see what Rock Hard's got for a question. And our question is... Does a burning hell exist right now? Does a burning hell exist? Uh, no, it doesn't exist, and um, it shall never exist as a burning hell, as in the sense of eternal torment just sitting in fire, because the lake of fire being the second death, as it is written in Revelation 20, verse 14, um, I'll read it, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. The second death is the death of your um, your spirit, your soul. It's You're, you're done after that point. Um, you know, when you die in this flesh, that's the first death. And, and like Mark said, or Sam, that is, in uh, Jude, they're twice dead. That means that their their flesh is dead, and, and so is their their soul. They're, they're set up to go into that lake of fire unless they snap out of it. It comes into common sense. I mean, what happens to your flesh when it dies? You never return to it again. It's done away with. So that would lead you to come to the second death, your spirit. What's that going to happen? It's going to be done away with. You're never going to return to it. As the flesh goes back to dust, so does pretty much your soul. As God is a consuming fire and he consumes all those that offend him, um, and they're they're rid of. I suggest reading this twentieth chapter of the book of Revelation. Um after Satan um gets released after that thousand years are expired, he gets to deceive once again. And then we have that white throne judgment and all those that feel like following Satan into the lake of fire follow him in and that's it. It's about five minutes. Um if that they're just gone forever and ever. Blotted out. Exactly. They no longer exist eternally. Not that they, they, they no longer exist, period. Um, not that they burn continually over and over and over. Yeah, and I also have a, stu a study called What is Hell, for those of you interested in digging deeper into that subject. Okay, <clears throat> next question. This was one that was asked to me on my website. If a person goes to war like they did in the world, all, all the wars of the world, from uh, time and memorial to now, and they kill an enemy combatant, combatant, are they committing a sin? Because one of the Ten Commandments is, thou shalt not kill. So your answer is no. The correct translation is, thou shalt do no murder. Murder is personal. That is, to lie and wait premeditatively. Those who go out on the battlefield do not know who they're going to kill. They only know that an enemy is firing at them and they're firing back. And sometimes a person never sees the person that they kill. And I know many people have come back and suffered post-traumatic stress, stress syndrome and uh, all kinds of other problems because they were forced to kill in war and they didn't believe in it. But... Let your soul be at rest over this, because God himself has called for wars. God himself has ordered Israel to go out and kill people. And, you know, if you understand why he did those things, then uh, 
you won't be confused like so many who say, God condones murder and kills people and tells his precious little chosen children Israel to go out and just kill people. Well, there were reasons for that. Uh, uh, one of the reasons that comes to mind off the top of my head is they had giants among them and giant seed. And uh, there was another influx. There was the second influx of giants after Genesis chapter 6. How do we know this? Well, where did uh, Goliath, which is to say Goliath, come from? I mean, he, he's well after the flood of Noah. And where did the Anakims come from? And the uh, Zamzamims and the Emims and the Raphim? Where did they all come from? Well, they had to come from somewhere. The only possible place was that the fallen angels had a second influx. So it takes a little bit of common sense. But no, it is not a sin to go out into battle and you're, you're not going against God to stand up for your country or to protect your family or to protect your rights, freedom, and liberties. God expects those things of you. So, no, it is not a sin. It is a sin to commit murder, but the proper translation should not be thou shall not kill. It is thou shall do no murder. In other words, thou shall not lie in wait to do murder. So there you have it. Marco? Next question, is marijuana a godly plant? Well, God created it, yeah, but are you, you're supposed to be sober-minded, like Paul says in Titus and other places. So obviously marijuana is being misused. If by godly you mean did God create it, well, yeah, of course. But if you want to find out about all the various good uses of that particular plant, Go look it up for yourself. You can make rope, paper, methanol, and so on and so forth. It's like he made the ocean, okay? But if you drink a gallon of water out of the ocean, you're going to get real sick, right? So you're misusing the ocean. Is the ocean bad, or are your, is your behavior, is your misuse of the ocean? So there's your answer. Very good. Very good question. And our question being... Where is Satan? Where is Satan? Where is Satan right now? Um, a lot of people uh, have confusion over this, and um, we're going to go over it. So, uh, keeping in mind Revelation 1, verse 10, that John was taken to the Lord's day, he was taken in the Spirit, and he saw the events therein and after and before. Um, so, before Satan was cast out was a time right about now. Um, you know, that's what we're looking forward to is the sixth trump when Satan appears as Antichrist. But in Revelation 12, it, it talks about this matter. The reason I say that is people will read this and say, well, it's saying was. It's saying it's past tense when, like I said, John was taken to the Lord's day. And so I'm going to read from Revelation 12, verse 7. There was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. We know this dragon is Satan. Eight and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Um, verse 10, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation, and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accuseth them before our God day and night. So that's what Satan's doing right now is accusing us for all the bad things that we do and throwing it in God's face. Every time we mess up, he, he makes sure to rub it in God's, God's face. So that's why it's important to repent daily, to exercise that repentance. But that's where Satan is. Obviously, his influence is heavily upon earth, just as we have the Holy Spirit from our Heavenly Father that warms and comforts and leads and guides and directs and touches us. Um, there's that negative influence being Satan, and he leads and guides his children and, and others as well. Very good. Very clear and concise on that. Now, my final question of this episode. This was also asked to me in an email. When was Jesus actually born? I heard you say that he was not actually born on Christmas, so when was he born? 
Well, there is a formula in the Bible which will allow you to figure this out. It begins in the book of Luke chapter 1 with um, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, who served his duty to the temple, that is to say to the tabernacle, in the course of Abiah. The course of Abiah, if you go by the Hebrew solar calendar, which is much more ac uh, accurate than our Gregorian calendar, falls from June 16th to the 19th. Okay? So, here you've got Zechariah serving from the 16th to the 19th. Okay? Well, when he gets done with this service, it's the end of the day. In other words, it's nighttime. Uh, it, it, by the Hebrew calendar, the day changes as soon as the sun sets. So, he would not have been leaving in the middle of the night to go home. So he would have left on the 20th, in other words, this Zechariah, father of John the Baptist, would have led, uh, left on the 20th from Jerusalem. And of course, he was an old man stricken in years, so it's going to take him a few days to get home, probably uh, using an ass, which is to say a donkey, to carry his uh, robes and his stuff and all of his accoutrements that he would need. And... Like I said, he's old and stricken in years, so he's going to get home probably about the 23rd, maybe the 24th, and he's going to need a day to rest up or so, and uh, then he will be with his wife Elizabeth, and she will conceive John, okay? So that sets a date for John's conception roughly about uh, June 25th. Now... Also in the book of Luke, it is written that the angel of the Lord visited Mary with good tidings and told her that she would bear a son and to call his name Jesus, which is to say Yahshua. And in those same days, in other words, that uh, same day or, or the next morning after, she went and greeted her cousin Elizabeth. And it's written that upon the salutation of Mary to Elizabeth, that John, being six months in the womb, leapt. Okay, so add six months to um, June 24th, and what do you come, or June 25th, and what do you come to? December 25th. That means the conception happened on the 25th of uh, December, which would be our Christmas time. So then... If you go from that nine months, then that brings you around to about the time of September 25th. And uh, there are historical records of a great light which led the Magi. And not only that, from writings of other people that were in the Middle East and to the north of the Middle East, that saw this uh, great light in the sky between the 27th and 29th. So, most likely, Christ's birth was on one of these days, from the 27th to the 29th. Uh, probably the 29th. Uh, it could have even been the 28th, but that's when you'll find that Christ's birthday is. It was in September, and it was not in December. December was the conception. Now, no one can be absolutely sure, but again, there are writings that say that there was a great light in the sky during that time. And uh, that was the star of Bethlehem, so there you have it. That's when Christ was actually born. And all you have to do is figure out that formula. It's fairly easy to follow if you just do your math properly. Who are the two witnesses? Well, we don't know, but... Um... We have several clues, like in Revelation 11, verse 6, they have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Well, that's like Elijah. Hey, and have power over waters to turn them to blood. Well, Moses did that, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And who appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration with Christ, Moses and Elijah. One represents the prophets, the other the law. So if I had to guess, I'd say Moses and Elijah are the two witnesses. But again, uh, all we have are, are good 
lead solid leads. Well, as that, far as that, that goes. seems pretty plausible to me. Yeah, uh, it's, it's the amount of transfiguration kind of ends the case. It's kind of case closed for me. Yeah, kind of kind of nails it home, don't it? <laughs> yeah. Sure does. And our next question is: What is the unforgivable sin? I see a lot of people have no idea what the unforgivable sin is, but we're going to nail it right on the head. And uh, Luke 10, excuse me, Luke 12, verse 10, and it reads, And whoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven. 11. And when they bring you unto the synagogues, and unto magistrates and powers, take ye no thought how or what ye shall answer or what ye shall say for the Holy Spirit shall teach you in the same hour what ye shall say so if you connect this with Mark 13 verse 9 I'm going to read it as well so keep what I just read in mind but take heed to yourself for they shall deliver you up to council so this is the period of time in which it's going to happen okay and I'm going to give you a clue this is when Satan's on the earth after he's cast out okay he's not residing in heaven anymore because he was cast out from Revelation 12, okay, and he's on earth and he's claiming to be Christ. Okay, and the whole world is deceived as it is written. It shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogues you shall be beaten, which is to say browbeaten. Okay, you're one of the very few of uh, being God's elect standing against Satan. And, and as the two witnesses are, you know, they're standing against Satan. They're saying um, the truth. They're, they're sticking with Father's word, sticking with Father, staying true to Christ um, and for the true husband. Because we know there's two husbands coming. So, of course, you're going to be browbeaten and called many names um, for in doing so. Because you're going to be looked at as a devil worshiper. While, in reality, they're really devil worshipers. Um, and you shall be brought before rulers and kings for my name's sake. For a testimony against them. And the gospel must be first published among all nations. So, the, right there, that is when the cloven tongue from Acts 2 speaks through everybody. And is dispersed in every language. To where all will, under, all will understand in their own language, and um, that's when the elect are delivered up. So in this hour, if you refuse for the to be delivered up and to let that Holy Spirit be published among all nations with it speaking through you, that's the unforgivable sin, and it can only be committed by one of God's elect. Um, in this hour, being the hour of temptation. So right now we're not in that hour of temptation, so you can't even commit it yet. Um, but I'll keep reading for verse 11. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what you shall speak, neither do you premeditate, but whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that ye, that speak ye, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Spirit. So again, it is the Holy Spirit speaking through you. Um, so you deny that, that's blaspheming the Holy Spirit. That is the unforgivable sin. So this is when you are um, being delivered to death, which is to say Satan. And that is probably a sin that none of the elect will actually commit. Um, there is some supposition that it could be committed, but I think God's election being chosen before the foundations of the world, God, he, God pretty much knows um, who they are. Well, of course he knows who they are, but he pretty much knows the character of their personage. That's why it's written, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. So... No doubt the ones that are most capable and most able to stand against Satan will be in this generation, this final generation of the fig tree, to face off against the Antichrist and to speak up and uh, deliver this cloven tongue and to convert even the gainsayers that is, as it is written. But anyway, that is uh, the end of our questions and that's the end of this particular episode for this uh evening this uh, week anyway and uh, please join us again when we uh, gather together to teach the Word of God and uh, we hope and pray that you will study in your father's word to show yourself approved every day and we hope that in some small way we have helped you to a better and more clear understanding of our father's word for the four winds this is Sam of mark 13 records and we're Logan and Hunter from 1234 Rock Hard Bible Study Channel on YouTube. And of course, I am Bruce from Just Thought Studies 
on YouTube. And until next time, may our Father in Heaven bless you and open your eyes and ears to the truth as you study from this His Most Holy Word to show yourself approved. And thank you for listening, and God bless you.